me start by thanking Eduardo and the organizers for uh, bringing me to this fantastic uh, meeting here and to the lovely city of Buenos Aires. I'm having a great time here. Um, well, in uh, Germany, in my department of systems and uh, computation and neurobiology, we study information processing in single nerve cells and small neural circuits. And as a practical example of that, we used the visual course control system of flies. And before explaining to you what the holy grail of fly motion vision is, I want to briefly introduce to you the fly visual course control system. Well, when the fly is buzzing around, the images of the environment permanently move across the retina. And we can picture that and mathematically precisely describe that as a vector field, which is called the optic flow. And within this optic flow, each arrow uh, points in the direction at which uh, this image pixel is moving at this point in time. And the length of the vector uh, indicates the velocity by which this image pixel is moving. So the visual input is then sensed by the array of photoreceptors in the retina, and then processed by uh, four consecutive layers of neuropil called the lamina, the medulla, uh, the lobular, and the lobular plate. And as the single most important computation in this processing chain, there is elementary motion detection, which calculates the local motion vectors. And as a result of that, the activity of columnar neurons reflect the uh, motion field now neurally, and we call that the neural flow. Well, at the level of the lobular plate, you see here three examples of large tangential cells which then spatially integrate over these local motion detectors. And as a result of that, they have large receptive fields and are directionally selective in different parts of, this, uh, of the visual field. And here, for example, you see the receptive field of a cell that is tuned to uh, rotation around the fly's vertical body axis. And this now is an example of a neuron that is tuned to rotation of the fly around the longitudinal body axis. And there's a set of about 20 different tangential cells on each hemisphere in the fly. And collectively, they encode basically the fly's ego motion based on this optic flow that they respond to. And these cells are thought to control the flight maneuvers as well as head movements of the fly. Today, I want to concentrate on elementary motion detection that leads to direction selectivity in the first place. Well, this phenomena of direction selectivity has already beautifully introduced by David Fitzpatrick, and I want to emphasize that unlike uh, cortical neurons uh, that David is studying, the neurons that we study in the fly do not depend on visual experience. If you take a fly, uh, that was dark raised and you measure the receptive field, it looks just like these examples that you see here. So no experience required in the fly. There's no plasticity here. But why is that an interesting neural computation? What needs to be computed? Well, the uh, fact is that if you take a fly and you move a bar in front of the fly to the right and to the left, and you have your electrode in the photoreceptors, then you see that the photoreceptors respond both times the same way. They depolarize to rightward motion and they depolarize to leftward motion. So based on the activity of a single photoreceptor, you cannot tell the direction of motion. Now, if you take the electrode and move it a few synapses downstream into the lobular plate and you record from one of the tangential cells, you see direction selectivity. Now the neuron depolarizes in response to um, uh, rightward motion and it hyperpolarizes in response to uh, leftward motion. So how can that be? There is direction selectivity computed between the photoreceptor output and the lobular plate tangential cells. Well, a model developed by Werner Reichert more than 50 years ago describes exactly this computation how you go from non-directional input signals to directional output signals. The model consists of two mirror symmetrical subunits that share the same inputs. In red, you see the left subunit. 
In, right, in blue, you see the right subunit. Within each subunit, the signal from one photoreceptor is being delayed by a temporal low-pass filter with time constant tau, subsequently multiplied with the instantaneous signal from the neighboring photoreceptor. That's done twice in a mirror symmetrical way. The output of both subunits becomes subtracted, leading to a perfect direction selective output signal. Now, this model is one of the most successful models that I know of in neuroscience, close to Hodgkin, Huxley, and Rosenblatt's uh, perceptron. It is, in case of the fly tangential cells, a perfect descriptor uh, of what we observe. Uh, just uh, as an example, this experiment done by Hubert Eichner, uh, a grad student in the lab, he used a square wave grating that was moving from the left to the right uh, with this white noise uh, Gaussian velocity profile. And at the same time, he recorded the spiking activity here in blowflies from a large tangential cell called the H1. And you see the spike frequency over time here. What you see, first of all, is whenever the pattern moves to the right, the H1 fires bursts of action potential, so it's direction selective. When the pattern moves to the left, then the cell ceases to fire, it's getting silenced, so it has a nice direction selectivity with rightward as the preferred direction. And now Hubert has been simulating an array of Riker detectors, here shown in the lower left corner, and feeding this output of this array of Riker detectors into a leaky integrated fire neuron so that you get action potentials out that you can then compare with the activity of the neuron. And I think you have no problems seeing the perfect match between the neural responses and the model responses. So clearly we have these units presynaptic to the tangential cells and it's more than natural to look what neurons do we find presynaptic to the tangential cells. So let's look at that. We cut a slice through the optic lobe and we now take a horizontal section and look at the various cell types that we find in the visual system of the fly. What you see is that there are, first of all, the photoreceptors that bring the signal into the lamina. Then there are several lamina neurons bringing the signal from the lamina into the medulla. In the medulla, you have several types of uh, local interneurons connecting different layers. And then you have neurons that bring the signal from the medulla into the lobular, into the lobular plate. And we will meet these cell types later again. Now, the first account of the different cell types of the fly optic lobe has been done almost 100 years ago, again by who else? Ramon y Cajal. He has done everything, and um, he already described, based on the staining method of his competitor, more than you know, 30 different cell types of the fly optic lobe. A more full account of the cell types in Drosophila was later given by Fischbach and Dietrich, which described about 100 different cells per column in the optic lobe of Drosophila. Now the problem is that all these cells are really, really small and sometimes their processes are down to 100 or 150 nanometers. So there is no chance that we can record from these columnar neurons with the sharp electrode from these processes. And as a result of that, we know close to nothing about the visual response properties of any of these neurons. Now, on the other hand, we have the Riker detector, which I told you is a perfect descriptor of the transformation from the retinal signals onto direction selective signals that feed into the lobular plate tangential cells. Uh, but this is an algorithmic description of what's going on. The Riker detector does not talk about neurons, so it's more like a, a black box that we can use to describe the input-output transformation. In particular, we don't know what cells constitute the Riker detector, and we don't know about the biophysical implementation of these interesting processes described by the Riker detector, like temporal low-pass filtering or multiplication.
And in particular, I want to draw your <laughs> attention to this problem of how you multiply neurally two input signals, and especially respecting the sign rule of multiplication, where you say that the output should go positive in a supralinear way when both inputs go positive, but also when the both inputs go negative. And so th that's sort of hard to think of how sh should that be implemented neurally. So in brief, finding the neurons that implement the Reichardt detector in the fly visual system became sort of the holy grail of fly motion vision to me and many other uh, labs in the world. And so a few years ago, we asked the little fruit fly, Drosophila, with its powerful genetics to help us open that black box. So as you all know, Drosophila has powerful genetics and in, we've been particularly using the GAL4 UAS system where you cross two strains. Uh, here you see the um, GAL4 expressing uh, strain which is um <coughs> called our driver line. And the driver line uh, defines uh, in what neurons um, this gene X is being expressed and you cross that with the expression line and the expression line determines what, uh, what protein is being expressed. And in particular, we've been using the expression line Shibiri TS, which a gene that encodes um, the GTPase dynamine, uh, which is used for vesicle recycling. And if you mutate that, you shut down synaptic output from that particular neuron. And we've been uh, in particular using a temperature sensitive allele of Shibiri uh, which ensures normal synaptic transmission at room temperature, but if you raise the temperature to 37 degree, then you shut down synaptic transmission. And the enormous advantage for all these experiments that I'm going to describe to you is that we could use the same genotype for control and experimental flies, and for the experiment, we simply put the flies to 37 degrees prior to the experiment, and then, uh, you know, blocked uh, the uh, <coughs> synaptic transmission from the neurons that we investigated. And very important step along this way was um, that a grad student in the lab, Max Jösch, established whole cell patch recording from the tangential cells in Drosophila. And here you see the direction selective response of a vertical sensitive neuron in, of the lobular plate in Drosophila. Uh, when you move the pattern upward, the cell hyperpolarizes, that's the null direction. When you move the pattern in front of the flight downward, it depolarizes and shoots a burst of action potential, that's the preferred direction. So we could use this recording from the tangential cells as our electrophysiological readout of the motion response and then block various candidate neurons presynaptic in the optic lobe using Shibiri, and by this way, we could then identify neurons that participate in the circuit that leads to a direction selective response. And as a start, uh, we began by asking which of the different laminar neurons provide the input signal to the motion detector. And um, for those of you who are not in the business, uh, you should know that the photoreceptors are one to six synapse onto five different laminar neurons called L1 to L5, and they all sort of bring the visual information in parallel into the medulla, into uh, different layers. So which of these pathways is the motion pathway? And there was uh, initial evidence that L1 and L2 play a particular role. That was from behavioral experiments done by Jens Riste in Martin Heisenberg's lab. And so we focused on L1 and L2, and we could also use specific driver lines that label the here, you see the medulla staining, uh, L1 terminals and L2 terminals in particular. So we've been using grading motion in the preferred and in the null direction of the cell. We've been blocking L1 and L2. What did we get? Well, if we block L1, we saw a strong reduction of the motion response, both in preferred and null direction. If we block L2, we also saw a strong reduction. Maybe not as strong as with L1, but still significant. If we block both L1 and L2, the motion response is gone completely. So we conclude that L1 and L2 indeed constitute the main input lines to the motion detection pathway in Drosophila. But we did not see any functional differentiation in which respect 
is L1, blocking L1, different from blocking L2. We investigated several possibilities, like L1 feeding into a horizontal system, and L2 into a vertical system, or L1 into forward, L2 into backward, or L1 into low contrast, and L2 into high contrast, everything. Nothing was sort of congruent with the data that we got. Until we thought that maybe, as in the vertebrate retina, the photoreceptor signal in flies is split into an on and an off pathway. And so we thought about stimuli that allowed us to uh, ask this question, and the stimuli that we came up were a single polarity moving edges. And here you see an on edge moving downward, and here you see an off edge moving downward. And using these two stimuli, we saw a distinct difference when we blocked L1 versus when we blocked L2. Now, blocking L1 led to a complete abolishment of the motion response um, in response to on edges, where the response to off edges was still nice. Contrast when blocking L2, the response to the moving on edge was still good. These are two different driver lines that we used, but the response to the moving off edge was completely gone. So as a conclusion, published two years ago, we found that indeed the photoreceptor signal in the fly visual system is split into an on and an off pathway represented by the laminar neurons L1 and L2. As soon as we had this result, of course the next question was, now how many motion detectors are we dealing with? If you think about an input splitting into an positive and a negative part, then you could, in order to provide a mathematically uh, uh, exact multiplication, um, you would need actually four interactions between you know, all combinations of on and off. So you know, there was the possibility that we're dealing with four motion detectors po per column, one dealing with on-on, the other one with off-off, and here the two mixed detectors on-off, off-on. Conversely, we thought that maybe the fly gets away with just two motion detectors, doesn't know the strict sign rule of multiplication, so it deals just with you know, correlating on-on and off-off. And in order to discriminate between the two models, we used apparent motion stimuli where you flash the luminance of two adjacent stripes uh, briefly next to each other. And here you see the stimulus paradigm, you have a flash of this uh, location, then you have a short pause, then you have another uh, flash in the adjacent stripe, and you do that in the preferred and the null direction, and this one is the red trace, the other one is the blue trace, and you subtract preferred um, and null direction from each other to get the final result. Now these two models made very distinct and different predictions. The four detector model, still looking, yeah, here it is. The four detector model predicts positive responses to on-on and off-off, and negative responses to on-off and off-on, like in a real multiplication, right? The two-quadrant detector, which only has on-on and off-off subunits, only predicts positive responses for on-on and off-off, and almost zero responses for these mixed stimuli. 